Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island is a fully cooperative game where players take on the roles of different survivors who have been shipwrecked ashore on a deserted island. They face many challenges like finding food, building shelter, inventing weapons, exploring different terrains, fight through fierce weather, snowstorms and the blistering cold to see whether they can survive together and make it through the island alive. Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island is designed by Ignacy Shevichek, published by Portal Games and Z-Man Games. Robinson Crusoe is a medium to heavy cooperative game. It has an incredibly steep learning curve, but the actual gameplay, once you get your head around everything, is superb. It is one of the best board games that I have ever played. There are six incredibly challenging scenarios, all vastly different. Feels like six different mini board games in one. To set up a game of Robinson Crusoe, players select one of the six different scenarios provided on these scenario cards. For this example, we'll be looking at Castaways. Players read the scenario and set up the board according to the card instructions. Read the objectives for winning. Each person selects a character card. Each player's character card details the character's health, special abilities, wound spaces, and special invention. Shuffle six random book icon event cards and six random adventure icon event cards together to make the event deck. For the castaway scenario, place the starting food crates event card on the right hand side of the event space. Place the morale marker cube at zero. Place the starting island hex tile on the left hand side and then the starting camp token on the hex tile. This represents the place where you get washed ashore. Draw two random starting item cards. Each cube represents how many times you can use that starting item. Shuffle the build, gather and explore adventure decks and place them in the places shown. Place a black cube at level 0 on the weapons track and three black cubes to the side of the shelter construction track. Place the nine starting invention cards in the invention area. Place another five random invention cards, invention side up on the invention area as well. Place a black marker on the island icon to show that that terrain has been explored. Place the round marker on the round track on the scenario card. Don't forget that if you uncover tokens with symbols, please reference the scenario card to see what they are. There are also other invention cards that are listed on the actual scenario track itself, each with its matching requirements and also matching terrains. Each round of Robinson Crusoe is comprised of six distinct phases. The event phase, the morale track phase, the production phase, the action phase where players allocate their tokens to particular actions that they would like to complete, the weather phase, and the night phase. The phases are clearly marked on the map on the chart above here and work sequentially around the board. In the event phase, the first player draws the event card from the top of the event deck. The event card is divided into two halves, the top half and the bottom half. Players in the event phase only resolve the top half of the card. In this card, players place a brown question mark on the build uh, venture deck and lose one morale. If players draw a card with a book icon on it, please refer to the scenario card for the book icon effects. As the game progresses through each round, uh, the event phases that are unresolved are moved over to the left as new event cards arise. If an event card were to be placed, but there is no space for it, the one on the end gets pushed off 
and the new one gets placed. With the card that gets pushed off, resolve any effects written here at the bottom of the card. In the first round of the game, players skip the event phase because there's already an event card in the event space. The morale phase only affects the first player. Resolve whatever effects the white cube is marked on um, immediately in this phase. If the white marker is on this space here, the first player gets one determination token. If it is on this space here, loses one determination token. If the player can't discard a determination token, then they receive one wound for each missing token. So in this case, because it's on minus two determination tokens, the first player would lose two health points. If the wound marker were to ever cross one of the arrows on a character's card, then move the morale phase marker one space to the left. In the production phase, players gain resources based on where their camp is located. In this case, the players would gain one wood and one perishable food, signified by the yellow and brown cubes. These cubes get placed in the available resources section of the board. Note that this top section is called the future resources section and cannot be used yet. In the fourth action selection phase, players use their action selection points to decide from seven different actions. Resolve a threat in the event space. Two, hunt for an animal if there is a card in the hunting space. Three, attempt to build. Four, attempt to gather. Five, attempt to explore. Rearrange the camp. Seven, rest. When resolving a threat, look at the event cards in the event space. See if you can fulfill their requirements to prevent the threat from occurring. So here, you will need two workers to then discard this card to gain two determination tokens and one morale. If players want to go on a hunt, they require two player action tokens. There also must be a beast card in this space shown. To resolve a beast card, subtract your weapon level from the beast strength. If the beast strength is more, take the rest as character wounds. If the beast strength is less, you suffer no damage. Gain food and fur as shown on the beast car. In the build, gather and explore phase, die rolls are used to determine whether players are successful or not. Players will roll three dice of the corresponding action color to see if they're successful or not. If a player rolls a question mark, they draw an adventure card of the corresponding color. If they roll a broken heart, it means they lose one wound immediately. This symbol means draw two determination token. This V means victory and the player is successful at the skill that they're trying to attempt. Building requires one or two pawns. If there are two pawns, the build is automatically successful. If it's one, the players will need to roll the corresponding colored dice. If there is a brown question mark token on top of the deck, resolve that immediately. The build action allows players to attempt to build a shelter, roof, palisade, weapons, or inventions. Some inventions are player specific, scenario specific, or require certain terrain to be explored. When building an invention, players need to ensure that they have explored the correct terrain before attempting a build. When attempting to build a shelter, roof, or palisade, players need to look at this table above here. This is for two players, three players, four players. It's very important when interpreting this table that players realize that this forward slash means all. So in upgrading your shelter, players pay, if you're playing a three player game, three timber or two fur, not both. If players wish to upgrade their weapon level, players need to pay one timber per weapon level upgrade. If a player builds a character specific invention successfully, they get two determination tokens. Gathering requires either one or two pawns. When gathering, players gather resources from adjacent tiles to the camp space. If a player only use one action token, they need to roll the dice. In some circumstances, players may gather resources from a hex tile one hex tile away from the camp space. In this case, it takes two action tokens to attempt to gather resources and three to ensure a success. The explore action requires either one action token or two worker action tokens. In the explore action, players draw the top hex tile from the hex tile deck. If players use only one action token, they need to make a dice roll attempt. If players use two action tokens, they explore successfully and they gain any bonuses that are shown on the hex tile and resolve any effects 
based on the scenario card. Resolve any tokens immediately. When players receive tokens and resources in this way, they get placed in the future resources section of the production phase box. If a beast icon is shown, place a beast card in the beast area. Place it face down. When rearranging the camp, the player gets two determination tokens and one morale. The player chooses rest, they recover one health. When resolving actions, they resolved in the order shown down here below. Also, if there is a token on top of a deck, when it comes to resolving that particular action, flip one of the adventure cards and resolve it immediately. At the end of the action phase, move all of the future resources into the available resources box. Flip any built inventions onto their other side. In the weather phase, refer to your scenario card. If the card has a weather die marked or allocated to it, then the dice need to be rolled and resolved immediately in this phase. There are two things that need to be resolved. Winter and rain. Winter signified by a snowflake, rain by a rain cloud. When resolving winter, count the snow symbols and discard one wood for each snow. When resolving the rain, count the cloud symbols, compare the roof levels that you currently have of your shelter to each cloud and for each roof level that's missing for each cloud discard one food and one wood. For every unfulfilled demand take one player wound. These wounds affect every player. In the night phase feed each player one food or suffer two wounds per player without food. Decide whether to move the camp to an adjacent tile. If you choose to move the camp to an adjacent tile Halve the palisade and roof levels rounded up. If you were in a natural shelter, you lose all roof and palisade levels. Once all of that has been resolved, check the shelter levels. If there is no shelter, then all players receive one wound. Discard all of the yellow perishable food from the available resources bank. But if there is non-perishable food, that can stay. Advance the round marker to the next round. Pass the first player token to the next player. Where do I begin? There is so much to love about the game Robinson Crusoe. First of all, it provides some really monumentally interesting storytelling moments throughout the gameplay that really makes you feel like you are a character stuck on a deserted island and encountering the actual events that the game throws at you. You're dealing with very real life problems that make you um, immersed in the actual environment, make you feel like you're uh, you're trying to be a survivor and the effects are very very punishing. One of the best mechanisms in this uh, game is the adventure card mechanism where something that happens to you earlier in the game like you might have eaten some berries can come back and haunt you later in the game and give you some sort of negative surprising effect. Makes so much sense. So another example is that your camp is flooded and then later on if you don't manage the flood that Flooding can actually destroy all of your food and I really love the invention cards and how you actually need to explore particular terrain in order to invent a particular item and how the invention cards really give you some advantages and bonuses that really help you to push you along in the game. It's got that very Euro worker placer style elements to it which I really like and it really just evokes that sense of I have all these uh, stuff that I need to have done and what choices should my character make and what choices should the other characters make based on the abilities of my character. So if I'm the cook, I need to find ways to provide food for everyone so that they are well fed by the end of each round. Planning is very important, prioritizing the actions and what you need to do and I really like how you can help the other characters by giving them your action counters and ensuring that they succeed because that really makes the medic sense. If two of us go and explore, we're more likely to, to uh, gather resources successfully rather than if only one of us went out and explored. If you play this at the lower play counts, it still plays incredibly well. As a solo game, this is such a fantastic game to play on your own. You can make your own decisions. You have the help of 
are s substitutive characters like the dog and Friday who give you particular ex extra actions and you can scale this up to three to four plays and have a full on debate and discussion for 10 minutes about whether we should move the shelter or not. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the fiddliness of the board game. Sometimes you have to move um, little tokens or little cubes and action pieces around and you can forget after an amount of time to do some upkeeping and that can um, really hold up the gameplay a little bit so you might get to the next round and go oh we forgot to move the round mark oh we forgot to move you know the resources from the future resources box to the available resources box the other thing is that there is incredibly steep learning curve through lots of rules. The rule book itself is not the best well written book. Uh, you have to try and decipher things. There's a lot of unanswered questions that require you to look up on Board Game Geek or use the 58 page reference um, errata that people have put together on Board Game Geek. You know, you just have to invest the time and energy into it in order to get the maximum value of this game and it is so worth it so i mean don't let the rule book deter you i read the rule book about three times before i kind of got the gist of what all the little niggly rules were about it is really important to play this game as a solo and that way you can familiarize yourself with all those niggly things before you actually introduce it to you know your gaming group or your family or whoever you want to play this with there's two things that really don't make thematic sense to me, and they're very small. First thing is that when you're playing solo, your morale is constantly quite high. You gain a morale in the morale phase if you're playing solo. And that, to me, doesn't really make that quite much sense because, you know, you're alone. Um, so how can you be so happy? You know, the whole idea that loneliness can kind of become you. Maybe, you know, you're an introvert. But then again, you do have the companion and uh, Friday there to help you. So that might balance it out. And I can see why the game designer did it to try and balance out the negative effects with some sort of positive um, effect for the actual single player. The other thing is when one player dies, everyone else loses the game. You know, that bit kind of doesn't make sense because, you know, if someone dies of starvation, it doesn't mean that everyone else should lose the game and die as well. So, considering my final verdict, Robinson Crusoe is for those people out there who love a rich storytelling experience and who love the survival and shipwreck theme. This is an adventure, a journey worth investing again and again and again. And this is Danny. Thank you for joining me for another review at Board Game Sanctuary. If you like my video, please subscribe and I'll see you guys later. Bye.